So let's talk for a minute about why does leadership matter. Any facts type in here? Like data? Let me share with you some data. LinkedIn did a study in 2014 on talent trends. And what they found was that 85% of employees are uncommitted in their roles. That is, they would leave your organization today if they got a better offer. 15, sorry, 12% are actively looking, usually on work time. 13% are casually looking a few times a week. We're suddenly at 25%. 15% are reaching out to a personal network. Now we're at 40%. Four in 10 of people in full-time employment are looking for a new job. And 45% are open to talking to a new recruiter. Only 15% are completely satisfied. Why do you think that is? Speak up. They're not getting what they want where they are. Why do you think that is? Come on, people, workshop. They don't know what they want. I would disagree. More like their manager doesn't know what they want. Their manager thinks they know what they want. What's missing? The communication. I'm sorry? The managers never ask them what they want. Are your employees there to serve you or are you there to serve them? Unfortunately, the psychology in many organizations is that the employees are just there to serve the owner or the manager. You're just a number, you're replaceable. What happens when that is the culture? Covert absenteeism? Sorry? Nobody's happy? What's the good news about this? that you can use to your advantage in business today. There's some very good news. There's a lot of great people out there where if you create an amazing culture, this can become your competitive advantage for your organization. You see, one of the things about business that's really important to understand. I'm going to go a little bit off script here. Is that okay? To be successful in business and leadership, you need to understand the difference between content and context. So the fruit is obviously in business, the fruit are the, thank you, the people. The fruit bowl, the content versus the context. Now, I'm a pretty generous guy. If I was to give each of you a rubber fruit bowl for Christmas, how well would that work? Gorgeous. Grey rubber fruit bowl. Looks good. Go and place it on the bench. What happens when we start putting fruit in there? It collapses and the fruit falls out. So what on earth has this got to do with business? <laughs> Absolutely. If your business is a floppy fruit bowl, you will lose all your good stuff. So it's your job to define the context of what your business is so you can attract and retain great staff. To create the fruit bowl that you've literally got people lining up to jump into there. So what's the context? What's the context that makes it a great fruit bowl? The vision, where are we going? Yeah, you know that sign on the front of the bus? Anyone here ever jumped on a bus that didn't have a sign on the front and thought, oh, this will be fun? The second part, the mission. The purpose of your organization, how you improve life for the people that you serve. The culture, otherwise known as the values of the organization. And lastly, the systems. You know what I see when I work with a lot of businesses? They say, yeah, we've got a clear context, Jeremy. It's always interesting. I get brought into an organization and they'll say, well, you need to fix my team. 
I'm like, really? So I speak with the team. And what I find is that this context isn't necessarily as rigid as some people would say. So if John here decides that he's going to start arriving 10 minutes late and I make an accommodation for him, let's move the fruit bowl a little bit to fit John. What's the message that I'm sending to the rest of my team? Being late's okay? Good. What else is the message I'm sending? That I'm flexible, so if we can move on this, we could move on this, obviously. Do you think the apple might start bitching to the banana about the fact that the orange is getting away with murder? And if you've set the context that that's what's expected in your workplace, that's 100% okay. But what I see is family businesses where we make special exceptions. Where, you know, one of the tough things with family businesses is family members can say shit to each other that they would never get away with, with employees, and they do it in front of other staff. What's important here is to create an environment where our people feel valued and safe. What happens when one bit of fruit of the fruit bowl starts to go off? What? It rots the whole bowl. And that comes to my next slide. You see, this is a study by Gallup in 2012 on Australian employee engagement levels. So what's engagement? For me, it's about care factor. It's about being prepared to go the extra mile to deliver above and beyond what has been asked. And what the survey found was that only one in four Australians in the workplace today are fully engaged. 60% are not engaged. What's not engaged? Doing just what's required. I'll be in at 8.29 and I'll walk out the door at 5.01. You see, not engaged staff, you've got their minds, you've got their bodies, but you haven't got their hearts. And that's where you're missing out on a huge performance opportunity. What about this 16% actively disengaged? Where, would, where and how would you see that showing up in staff? Sickies? I know employment law, it's my right to take two weeks of sick leave each year, normally on a Monday or a Friday. Disruptive behaviour, tell me more. Absolutely, being malicious, backbiting, fighting back against change and disencouraging others. Poor communication, well it can happen in all, each one of those areas but less than respectful communication very often. Employee, oh, that's a big one, just wasting. That can happen also with people who are just not engaged. You know, the actively disengaged ones. Here's the thing, what do we need to do with those members in our organisations if we know someone's actively disengaged? Get rid of them. Here's the thing, were they actively disengaged when they came into your organisation? What happened along the way? Someone broke trust with them. You see, what we need to do with those people is we need to have a difficult conversation. And you might want to write this down. The most difficult conversations deliver the best results. The most difficult conversations deliver the best results. You know those conversations that you know you really ought to have and then your stomach starts churning and you think it might be a good time to tidy your desk or I'll just go for morning tea first, let me think about this. You know what that thing is in your stomach? It's called fear. Is fear good or bad? Which one? Good? Bad? Here's the thing, it is what it is. It's a physiological response you can use it as an asset or a detriment. When you run away from fear, you're holding yourself back and you're holding others back. You see, courage is not the absence of fear, it's deciding something is more important than fear. 
every successful leader today has learnt to deal with fear. To acknowledge the fear and understand that that's a sign that it's time to go to work, to step up, take some action and make things happen. What lies on the other side of fear? Achieving everything you ever wanted. Where have you got to start? With the little things. What you tolerate, you deserve. Managing the context for employees is really important because when you let them get away with the little things, what's going to follow? The big things. So I wanted to share with you another formula for life success. And we need to ask ourselves the question, what makes someone a success? Why on earth would you classify someone as a success? Is it about money? Is it about flashy cars? Is it about lying on the beach all day? So the answer to all of those things is maybe. I take success back to a quote by Bob Dylan who says, a man is a success if he gets up in the morning, if he goes to bed in the evening, and in between does just exactly as he pleases. By which I believe he meant success is something that can only be defined on your terms. Your version of success is very different to someone else's. We don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. And what tends to happen is we project our values onto other people and say, what's wrong with them? And we forget to sometimes look in the mirror. So a successful person is someone who simply set out to achieve something, worked hard towards it and achieved it. If you're clear on what you want to have, is it pretty straightforward to figure out, well, what have I got to do? Hello? Yes or yes? How can we figure out what we need to do if we're clear on the goals? Sorry? Plan? What about if we don't know how to do it? Educate. Absolutely. Do you think we could track down someone who's already achieved the goal that we want to do? You see, almost everything's been achieved before, and do you think if we went to that person and said, I was wondering if you could help me? Look, I set a goal to do this. Would you be able to share with me a couple of ideas on how you did it so I can create a plan? But here's the big question for you. Who do you need to be? Who do you need to become to do the things that you need to do to have the results that you're after? And it's a little bit like walking into a store. Depending on what you want to buy, there's a price tag on it. The only question is, are you prepared to pay that price tag? I write this as a mathematical equation, B times do equals have. What you have in your life today is no more than a reflection of who you've been till now and how much you've done. So if you're not happy with the result, whose fault is it? If you want to have more, if you want to have better, what's your best option? There's two of them. Take a guess. If you want to have more, if you want to have better, there's two options here. Which one would you pick if you had to pick one? B. Why B? <laughs> better than A? Why would you choose B over two? Absolutely. Never wish life was different, wish you were better. If you were better, could you do less and have the same amount? When you take the time to learn a new skill, a new skill like touch typing or leadership, how long have you got to use it for? The rest of your life. How many people can you teach that skill? You see, one of the things to understand is that education is your highest form of leverage. Education of yourself and education of your team. So, the stuff you learn here over the next two days, what are you going to do with it? You're going to use it and you're going to teach it to teachers to learn twice. If you take one or two of these flip charts back and you teach them to your team, what's going to happen? Do you think it's going to embed more deeply in your psyche? You see, this B is all about what you know, your knowledge, the way in which you think, your attitudes, your beliefs, and also the people you hang out with. 